we're, uh, Fernando, we're, we're very okay. excited to have you. Fernando Rivera is the CEO and Chief Scientific Officer at ALS Therapy Development Institute, um, has been behind some really wonderful large scale uh, projects in, in biomarkers and people. But we also know that ALS TBI has done a huge amount of work um, setting the standard for the field in preclinical uh, biology in this disease. And I know we're excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you, James. All right, let me share my screen. Okay. And so today um, I have uh, the privilege and honor of talking about uh, preclinical models for ALS. It is a large topic, uh, pretty broad scope, and it probably could uh, consume its own uh, two-day symposium. Uh, so being mindful of time, um, I've had to limit it to some extent. Um, uh, it can't go as broad or as deeply as I'd like to. Um, but today, what you'll hear from me um, are some considerations in thinking about animal and thinking about ALS modeling, um, how to select models, think about uh, interpretation of models. Um, because uh, I have some experience in mouse models, and so does ALS TDI, um, the lion's share of my time will be focused on some mouse models of ALS. Uh, but I'll also spend some time touching on non-mammalian animal models of ALS that are growing in importance in the field. And of course, any discussion of ALS modeling uh, requires conversation about induced pluripotent stem cells, which are uh, a massive power in the field as well. Um, because I can't go into too much depth uh, during the allotted time, what I'll be doing a lot is pointing you to a lot of reviews that cover um, a lot of this material in more depth and encourage you to, to um, delve into those. Um, I want to start by just uh, uh, making this statement that no one model can accurately recapitulate all elements of ALS. I feel confident that that's a true statement because when I do sort of a uh, a little mental exercise or a thought experiment where you have imagine uh, an, an evil emperor who controls the dark side of the force who could clone any person. If you were to clone an individual with ALS, that one person with ALS would not accurately recapitulate all elements of everybody else's ALS. So it's impossible to have a perfect model. So we can dispense with that idea and instead focus more on the research questions that we're asking and which models are best deployed to answer the research questions that we're asking. And I think um, that's where we need to move as a field. So I put down some considerations, some polls of, of different considerations that one thinks about when selecting models for um, ALS research, basic research, or uh, therapeutic development. Uh, there are a lot of considerations, but uh, among them are whether or not you're focusing on a single cell type in biological processes in a single cell type, or if you're looking at cell interactions. And we there's a lot of evidence to uh, indicate that um, ALS is not a disease only of the motor neuron. Um, and to that point, uh, so if you are focusing on cell types, uh, specifically maybe in vitro in a dish, are they neuronal or are you actually focusing on other cell types like uh, immune cells, microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, NG2s, myocytes, all of which have shown at some point in time uh, to have primary pathology that might be implicated in ALS and may be druggable. Um, if you're focusing on motor neurons specifically, are you focused on upper motor neurons or lower motor neurons? In animal models, for example, different animal models uh, represent or present uh, disease manifestations more robustly in one set than another. Um, are you focusing on specific mutations, um, SOD1, TDP43, FUS, or are you thinking about um, more generalizable uh, biological pathways that might have uh, broader um, implications over to sporadic ALS. Uh, if you are looking at a specific target, a specific transgene, for example, is it very important that your level of expression be at physiological levels? Or is it more important that you develop a model that has a robust phenotype after all, models are for the practical application and the study of research in a uh, timely manner. 
And sometimes a phenotype that is more robust and arrives faster is more important uh, than physiological expression. But at the same time, you may have to contend with the artifacts that are secondary to that. Um, another consideration is whether or not you need your uh, research question to address whether or not something is disease progression modifying. Does it stop neurodegeneration? Does it slow down disease progression? Or is it enough in the context of something like an antisense oligonucleotide targeting a well-validated target, perhaps a gene implicated in ALS, um, to simply modify that target to reduce that transcript uh, before moving uh, to, to clinical development? Must your system be human? Um, is there not enough homology in possible non-human species models um, such that you have to study in human reagents um, using ex vivo samples or things like induced pluripotent stem cells. And finally, if you're going to work in an animal, uh, perhaps uh, you're thinking about uh, IND enabling studies moving forward into the clinic. Is it important for you to now be studying in a mammal rather than a non-mammal whole animal? So these are just some of the considerations that one thinks about when selecting or interpreting a model. Um, I'm starting uh, today by talking about rodent models because they kind of check off uh, a lot of these. Uh, each different model um, can check off different uh, uh, elements on these poles, but they're quite versatile and they're used uh, often in ALS preclinical research. Um, I'll bring your attention to a fantastic review that was just published in Nature Reviews Neuroscience by um, Tiffany Todd and Len Petricelli uh, just this year. And it's a great review, covers a lot of the models that we all uh, think about, um, but I liked this figure. And this figure is nice because it, it points out uh, some of the power of these types of models where you can have clear locomotor impairment, uh, coordination defects, weakness, muscle atrophy, um, and early lethality, which obviously we see in ALS. Um, which are concurrent with ALS-like pathology. So upper and lower motor neuron loss, neuroinflammation, various inclusion bodies, uh, peripheral axonopathies, neuromuscular junction abnormalities, et cetera. And it allows as well, these models allow for the emergence of more complexity. So um, a, a crossover into frontotemporal degeneration. So things like cognitive decline and impairment in learning and memory and anxiety. So um, this, uh, I, I highly recommend this review. I'll start today by focusing on the both venerable and maligned uh, SOD1 transgenic mice. Um, these have been worked with in the ALS space uh, for now more than 20 years. Um, they are not a monolith. There are actually many permutations and strains and backgrounds of these mice, and they have some very variations within them but they're quite versatile and they all generally show the same thing. I actually think that we were spoiled by these mice. Um, generating transgenic mice over expressing mutant human SOD1 does manifest in motor neuron degeneration. It's largely limited to lower motor neuron domains, uh, spinal cord. Um, but uh, it's, it's, I think we hoped that every time we threw a transgene into mice, we would get a model that looked a little bit like these. Um, they're well characterized, especially the SOD1 G93A, Gurney mice, the high copy. Uh, we at ALS TDI have probably worked with about 90,000 of these at this point in time. So we understand how these behave really well. And there are some great resources out there for using these mice, like um, these guidelines for preclinical testing and colony management uh, that were developed by Jackson Labs and Prize for Life about a decade ago. Uh, I highly recommend uh, using that as a resource. One of the major um, knocks on these mice is that they don't manifest with any TDP43 pathology. But I think that's an oversimplification. I think there is RNA binding protein involvement here, and we see um, uh, stress granule involvement and mislocalization involvement of another RNA binding protein, TIA1, uh, in these mice. Um, and I, I think uh, there is potential for these mice to be modeling um, something that does have overlap with many different types of ALS. 
Um, <laughs> we learned a lot about these mice in terms of their survival and neurological progression, but we're also starting to uh, use alternate um, measures of uh, disease progression in these. What you're seeing here is work done by uh, our group here, um, led by Dr. Theo Hatsopetros at ALS TDI, looking at compound muscle action potential or CMAP, which is um, roughly analogous to an EMG um, and motor unit estimate that you'd see in the clinic. And what we see in the SOD1 mice is early impairment, early reduction in compound muscle action potential amplitude, which is a surrogate for innervation um, in tibialis anterior. And this decreases over time. And this early CMAP is actually predictive of onset. So what we're actually seeing is that there's clear, uh, there are clear disease processes engaged in these mice well before there are overt symptoms. And this uh, somewhat justifies um, testing drugs, uh, treating the animals long before they have overt symptoms. In addition, as Dr. Berry mentioned earlier, um, we've been exploring um, the, uh, the, the elephant in the room, the, the uh, biomarker, or the large gorilla, I think you described, uh, biomarker in the uh, clinical space, neurofilament light. Uh, when we look at neurofilament and plasma of these animals, we see a really robust increase over time. Uh, it does not stabilize in these mice. It continues to, to um, compound, which may have to do with really the rapid rate of disease progression and, and that rapid uh, motor neuron loss, which essentially occurs um, over a three-month period. Uh, what you see on the right is evidence that this could be a surrogate marker preclinically uh, for disease efficacy. In this case, the drug here is a copper complex that uh, we invented here at ALS TDI that at end stage had shown a reduction of neurofilament that was circulating. Um, it may be useful to look at neurofilament levels earlier on in the disease course in these mice. And so we would like to use these same types of outcome measures in other animal models that we continue to work with. Uh, a different uh, type of transgenic mouse that we feel really good about that's been developed over the past few years are profilin-1 transgenic mouse models. Um, one of, again, versatile model, um, develops a disease that looks very much like ALS. Unlike the SOD1 mice, we do see some evidence of TDP pathology with uh, phosphorylated TDP43 detected in the, um, the nuclei of, of these mice. These mice were in parallel, independently developed in two different labs, one at the University of Arkansas and another at um, UMass Medical School. And they essentially demonstrate pretty much the same results, which is promising. Um, these results are persistent across generations and into other labs, uh, including here at ALS TDI, where we've acquired these mice from Jackson Laboratories, the University of Arkansas mice, and have been studying them for um, more than a year now. And what we're learning uh, from these mice is that uh, they do, uh, at approximately 160 days, start to have deficits in their grip strength. And around the same time, we start to see decreases in compound muscle action potential, uh, which is comparable to what we were seeing in the SOD1 mice. In addition to that, we see, like I said, a progressive ALS-like disease where these animals do die early. They don't die as early as the high coffee gurney mice. Uh, these animals die around probably about uh, 240 days, which makes them harder to use as preclinical drug screening models because you have to ha house them longer, so they're more costly. But I think the benefits outweigh the harms there. Um, having a second model with such a clear, robust phenotype uh, is a fantastic opportunity. Here, you're seeing that we were exploring two different diets. Um, we're not seeing a clear uh, difference in the diet on uh, clinical phenotype. We did that because in the initial studies, um, uh, fat uh, content and diet uh, seemed to predict um, uh, the uh, severity of disease. Pivoting now to different uh, 
set of uh, transgenic mice, RNA binding proteins. Obviously, RNA binding proteins are really important uh, uh, to the study of ALS and FTD. And many, many dozens of uh, rodent models, mice and um, rats, have been developed uh, since 2006, uh, when TDP43 uh, first came onto the scene. These are very well re um, reviewed by Dr. Kat Lutz in this uh, paper in Brain Research from 2018. I won't go into depth on all of them, there are too many. Um, but I will bring your attention to one that we and others are working with more and more. This is a prion promoter, uh, Q331K TDP43 mutant mouse. Uh, developed out of Don Cleveland's lab, which really showed um, in their hands a, a robust clinical phenotype as well. Uh, decrease in motor performance as the animals age, decrease in hind limb grip strength, and muscle motor evoke potential is somewhat analogous to CMAP, but it includes the upper motor uh, neurons in the circuit as well, show a major decline uh, as well. And we see axonopathy up to 10 months. Um, so we've been working uh, with these models as well. And in our hands, we see early deficits that, that are apparent deficits in compound muscle action potential um, as early as 62 days of age, but we're not seeing a decrease yet. So we're not sure if this is uh, a phenomenon of degeneration or something else or, or a developmental difference. But what we do see that's clear that emerges as the animals age is a hind paw clasp reflex difference. So there's a clear phenotype emerging in these mice compared to wild types. Um, and we're going to continue to work with these and hope to develop these into um, a preclinical drug screening model as well. So with that, um, I, I know I'm neglecting um, C9 ORF 72 models. It's a fraught topic um, and we don't have time to get into it today, but I hope I'll have an opportunity in the future to discuss those. Um, there are a lot of uh, variable results in that space. I'll pivot now to non-mammalian animal models, again, reviewed beautifully uh, here by Brahms et al. Uh, and Ludo Vandenbosch, um, where they have a a tremendous figure that they present, which really highlights um, the various phenotypes that one can use uh, looking at uh, C. elegans, Drosophila, fruit flies, or zebrafish to really try to study ALS. And these have differences and uh, advantages uh, because they're often smaller, easy to breed, less costly. Um, and have a lot of homology uh, with human ALS uh, disease genes. Um, however, um, these are newer in the space and less well characterized. And finally, like I mentioned, um, one cannot talk about modeling in ALS without discussing uh, uh, iPSC-derived motor neuron drug discovery in ALS, uh, pioneered in large part by Clive Svensson and Kevin Egan and others uh, over the past decade or so. Um, there have been many, many different protocols uh, demonstrated here in a paper by Dr. Svensson um, that have been used to uh, 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 generate uh, purified motor uh, neurons uh, in culture. Um, we and others have uh, been using this protocol um, which gets you to really 95% pure motor neurons and really gives you the opportunity to, to study uh, different mechanisms of action and uh, therapeutically screen drugs. Um, recently reviewed again um, by Dr. Faraulo and uh, Maragakis are a number of therapeutics that have emerged directly uh, from uh, in vitro screening or cell-based screening in motor neurons from iPSCs. Um, it remains to be seen how these will translate clinically, uh, but uh, this is going to be an important uh, emerging finding uh, as we move forward in ALS. And so uh, limited time here, but I, I do want to make a closing comment that we know it'll take multiple treatments to ultimately effectively treat everybody with ALS. Um, we'll have to stack them on top of one another. And I think the same is true for understanding disease and discovering those treatments. It's going to take multiple models and they each have their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, 
But as long as we use them in appropriate context uh, and interpret the results uh, appropriately, uh, we put ourselves in position to succeed. Um, just to give you a sense of how we aim to do that at ALS TDI, um, we do uh, have a drug discovery phase, uh, which can is quite versatile. And where we have specific targets, we'll have biochemical target screens, and then we'll move into human-induced pluripotent stem cells, which depending on target space and, and relevance uh, to a specific patient population, we may move into zebrafish models before going into one of multiple mouse models. Right now, we're still mostly screening drugs in SOD1 mice, but the overall objective is to have these parallel pathways in which to evaluate uh, clinical leads in multiple models to get to IND enabling study candidates that can move uh, toward clinic that we can feel confident in. And with that, I'd like to thank ALS1 for the opportunity to present here today. Um, the science team at ALS TDI, fantastic, talented, hardworking, committed uh, group, um, bolded our folks who contributed to the work that I mentioned here today. Um, want to thank funders who contributed to the work I mentioned here today, uh, Augie's Quest and CDMRP and the Jim Heller and ALS Memorial Fund. And this is the list of reviews and papers that I cited today. Fernando, that was fabulous. Uh, covering a, a, a huge broad area, but you, you pointed us to, to really wonderful resources and appreciate those being in the, in the slides as well. We have uh, one question. How do we translate the mouse survival data to human survival data? Can you do that? How do we think about that? I think it's a great question. And let me just, I'm gonna add to that too. How do we think about that particularly when we're talking about treating at a very different point in the disease and how do we kind of overcome that? So I don't think we can uh, translate um, the you know duration of effect in mice to humans. I, I think um, it might depend on the model and it might depend on the mechanism of action. I don't think that mechanisms or, or disease biology areas are uniformly represented in each of these models. So if you have a model where um, mitochondrial pathology has more primacy in it and you target mitochondrial effect, you may have a more profound effect, a profound benefit, which I don't know if that would translate linearly to the clinic or to any particular patient. Vice versa, if uh, the, the disease biology is more, um, you're implicating the immune system and you're targeting that in a different model where that's more important I think it's impossible to really predict or say. Uh, I hope that answers the question. I think that's a that's a great answer. Um, uh, so there's there's another question about sort of a, a percent representing how much you know how much the translation is, but I think we'll take from your your answer that it's actually much more complex. Than yeah, I, I see it more. These are indications that if you have a statistically significant benefit in one of these models, it's an indication that you have a promising lead and that uh, speculating beyond that is probably not a worthwhile endeavor. I, when I just, we have we're very short on time for questions, but I do wanna ask you one other question, which is I think fundamental to, you know, you basically talked about kind of cell models and the way of the rodent models and then to rodent models. There's this, Kind of paradox, which is to say we use models to simplify the disease so that we can study it in a more focused way or some part of it in a more focused way. And then we often look at our models and say, well, that's not good enough because it doesn't incorporate the immune system or there isn't the cell autonomous component of this. And so we add in complexity and we go from an, you know, an IMN model to a um, organelle model. Or something. And, 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 um, but as we do that, that the paradox is as we do that, we then get closer to the complexity of the disease that has made it hard to study people in some ways. And so I, I wonder what you're thinking about. That. Mm. So I think about that a lot because again, to the point earlier that we create these, it's impossible for us to study all of the ideas that we have in the clinic. Right. And there are many good ideas out there. And even if you attack a specific area of disease biology, 
there are umpteen ways to attack that area of disease biology. It could be a single target. Look at the number of ways to go after SOD1, for example, right? It would be um, untenable to do all of those clinically. So we do need processes in the lab that are scalable, that allow us to vet ideas and arrive at what we think have a better chance more quickly to move into the clinic. And so understanding that um, there are going to be strengths and limitations to these yeah. models as a function of their simplicity or complexity. I also recognize that the, the more effective a therapy is in a more complex system, the more likely it will be to work in the most complex system. So I put more weight into the more complex systems. That doesn't mean that I throw out the concepts that emerge in more simple systems. It just means we have to put some weight somewhere. So, so James, I think Toby had a question. Uh, I, well, so uh, I can table it. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. I, I, well, only because you're going to be taking away from your own time. I think, uh, Fernando, <laughs> I want to thank you for for being here. We we started just a few minutes late, but you were great on time, actually. And and. Um, and uh, so we're gonna, and maybe hopefully, maybe Toby, you can even incorporate your question into into the meeting a little bit later. 